So there we see the beginnings or the continuation, really, of the persecution that had started, of course, with Jesus and had passed on to his disciples. So where are we as we come to this point in Acts? Let's just bring us up to date once again so we're fresh. The Spirit has ignited the growth of the church through the ministry of the believers. The Spirit is moving amongst them powerfully. And as we've been noting every single week, as we've looked at these, uh, these passages in the beginning of Acts, the Spirit is not there for the Spirit's sake. We see at every turn, the work of the Spirit is continuing to point the church, to enable the church to speak of Jesus and bring it back to Jesus and his work on the cross Every time they stand up and open their mouths, they eventually get to Jesus. And that is a glorious thing to behold. Yes, we celebrate the fullness of the work of the Holy Spirit through us. But the Spirit of God continually points to Jesus. First question of the day, does your speech continually point to Jesus? Does it? Well... Oh, well, Lord, you know, but does it, you know, let's get into the habit of how do we speak of him? And even when we're not using words, how does our life tell of him? So the gospel in these passages is being preached everywhere. We're, We're reading of thousands of people at a time who are coming to know Jesus as their savior in this time. And we're seeing converts from everywhere. You know, it's what the, Luke says, even the priests were coming, were coming into the kingdom of God uh, through discovering who Jesus Christ was. Well, we pray that may be true today as well. We want to see the gospel being spread everywhere. And this community that is forming, you're starting to see it's a real cultural mix. These are not just group of, you know, mates that used to meet together in a different way, but now they're meeting in a different new way with a new message. No, there's people coming from all around the world and from different backgrounds, converts from Judaism, those that are on the fringes, they're discovering Jesus for themselves and God is doing this new thing. And the, the, the capacity of these folks to cope with what the Spirit is doing was about to be radically changed because in a few chapters... We are then seeing a significant move of the Spirit through Paul, who's yet to be converted at this stage, to bring Gentiles into the faith. And the the first big arguments in the church uh, came in around this idea, what on earth do we do with these Gentiles? What do we do with these non-Jews as they come in among us? And so this is not easy. That they're, They're working it out as they go and as the Spirit enables them. But we're starting to see too some logistical problems that come up uh, in the context of this new community with spectacular growth. Friends, how would we do if in the next uh, seven days the Lord added three number, 3,000 to our number? Um, you, you think about that for a second. I don't think there's a hall big enough in Aaron uh, to hold us. We may have to spread out a bit, you know? We may actually get, have to get outside the building. This was a huge problem they were dealing with. And not only in terms of how do we get people to meet, but actually how do we meet the needs of our new community? Because one of the spectacular things we notice here, um, we we, we didn't look at it this time, we looked at it at the beginning of the year, but in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, we, we see that this community, yes, they were coming together in faith, but they were also really supporting each other. There's some place in Acts where it says there was no poor among them. Those that had sold what they had and presented the finances at the feet of the apostles and then they distributed it to those who were in need. And so there we come, that's the context for this wee problem um, that we have today because the wee Greek wifeys were complaining about the wee Hebrew wifeys that they were being overlooked in the sharing of the food around the table. Uh, Have you ever been to a church bun fight, you know, and you thought, oh my goodness, I didn't get a scone today, that's that's, that's terrible. But it's serious because in this new community, People were beginning to really foster a strong sense of community and there was that sense of, we'll get through this together, folks. And there was that sense of a, a disparity uh, coming up. We, we look in the pages of the New Testament and we think, oh, it must have been so holy, holy, holy. They're dealing with amazing things all the time. But as you go through <coughs> Acts, as I say, they, they're, they're sorting out all sorts of problems about being humans together. Has anyone ever been part of a perfect church? It doesn't happen. We remain very, very, very human. Um, and I feel very human this morning. But we, have, we see the Spirit at work. 
are solving out these problems. And there's, there's, a, there's a moment of divine inspiration that comes to the gathered body as they meet on this day. They decide for themselves that we're, we're, we, we want to make sure that everyone is blessed and cared for on one hand. But we also want to make sure that we are responsible for this work of ministry, uh, the preaching of the word uh, and the, the prayer that has to go into it, not only for the preaching of the word, but for the guidance that we need to be able to move forward. So uh, says we're going to have to we're going to have to call out some men uh, to wait on these tables. That's what we're going to need. Now, interestingly, Sometimes, if we're looking in the church for someone to do something practical, we'll think, oh, any old person will do it. Any old person will do it. And, and in a sense, it's true. Anyone can come and do something practical. But these, for these men who were, who were becoming part of the way that the church was going to organise itself, they, they, they didn't want to minimise whatsoever on the spiritual qualifications of those that were being called. And as things develop, we see that these, these men who were being called to be deacons, and there were women who were called to be deacons as well, we see that they were entitled to, they needed to have quite a significant spiritual identity upon him. You notice in that passage what we see? These were, were men that were being called to come alongside and really get their sleeves rolled up. They, they were going to uh, enact this spiritual ministry of caring for others. They, they were going to embody this ministry really of basin and towel. Who was it that initiated that ministry? It was Jesus himself. It was Jesus himself. He, 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 he came among them and said, you know, your leadership is not going to be like the leadership of everyone else that you see around you. But Jesus says, here's one of the ways in which you're going to lead. And he took off his garment, he wrapped it around his waist, he got the basin and he got the towel. And he got his disciples, you know, the ones that were following him. He got them to sit down and he washed their feet. And poor Peter, he was, he was yeah, no way, Lord, no way, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus says, Peter, you don't understand. If you want to have a part with me, you must, you must receive this. And Jesus said, this is how it's going to be among you. So we didn't have in this passage Peter and his gang saying, no, that, that, that's not good enough for us. But what they are saying is, this ministry of service is so important that we need to have it carried out by people who are doing it from the right heart in the right space and with the right spirit moving among them. They chose Stephen and the others, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip and the rest of the guys, who were full of the Spirit and full of faith. So this was no lesser role. And as the church moves on, uh, Paul puts in a few words about what deacons should be. Are you ready for this? Especially you deacons amongst us, are you ready for this? This is a scary passage. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever, uh, whoever the, um, desires to be an overseer, that's an elder, it desires a noble task. And then he lists all the qualifications of the elder. And then he says, in the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect. Sincere. I'm looking at you too. I'm looking at you too. Mm -hmm. Not indulging in too much wine. Not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with clear conscience. They must first be tested. And then, if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and manage his children and household well. Those who have served well gain excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. And so, this sense of, if the church is going to invite you into a position of, of exercising a ministry in his name, there's this sense of being worthy of it. And being tested, being tested, so that we can be sure that there are people here who are carrying the ministry of Jesus in a, in a worthy manner. Tested to be leaders. I don't know what this says really to you, but really when we consider what God calls us to do in the context of his church, uh, it really is a great privilege, isn't it? To be invited to be a part of the body of Christ and for each of us in certain ways to carry out ministry amongst each other. But for those who are being called to serve and to lead in a particular way, there's that elevation and we see that in these disciples. 
There's something specific that there was, these men were meant to carry as they ministered in the name of Jesus. And to do so with humility. There was a, there was a chap um, who was a, a contemporary of William Booth. Um, it's in my mind because today's Founders Day. Us weird Salvation Army background people remember these strange days. This is the, the day 163 years ago when the Salvation Army started in a wee tent in the east end of London on an old Quaker burial ground. Uh, and the Salvation Army had started to develop and become quite popular. And there was this guy. His name was Samuel Brengle. Dr. Samuel Brengle. And he was an American. And uh, he was starting to get a name for himself in America as, as a, a great teacher of the word. He, he was, a, he was a, a theologian. He had studied and he was a man of depth and he, he, was, a, he was a holy man. And, and he became really interested in the work of William Booth's Salvation Army. And he wanted to become a Salvation Army officer. And uh, William Booth heard about this, that this great eminent Dr. Samuel Logan Brengle uh, wanted to become a Salvation Army officer. And William Booth was a little bit suspicious, uh, as he's probably, probably tend, tended to be. Uh, and so they did eventually permit uh, Dr. Samuel Logan Brengle to come and be a Salvation Army officer. Um, but his first appointment as a Salvation Army minister was to be the person who cleaned the boots of William Booth. Now, that maybe, maybe give you the idea that maybe William Booth was a bit of an egomaniac, and he probably possibly was, um, but there was something really important that he was trying to say, um, that with all your degrees and with all your success and with all your whatever, the most fundamental place of being able to serve in the body of Christ is the ministry of basin and towel. That was his testing place. That was his testing place. Are you able to do that with humility, in quietness and in the background and to serve as Christ would serve when nobody else is looking? Are you able to do that? And when you can be faithful with the small things, Jesus says, then you might be able to be entrusted with the greater things. When we're entrusted with the small things. So this whole process of appointing these deacons, these servants, of moving people into this ministry was a test of not how spectacular a person can be up in the front, but how much they're willing and able to just get the sleeves rolled up and to practically minister in Jesus' name. And it's interesting, isn't it, that it's one of these guys, one of these servants that has the ominous privilege of being the first of the followers of Jesus to lose their lives. There's something so special about the way that these men were carrying themselves, not only the way that they were carrying themselves, not only the way that they were ministering, but also the ways in which they were able to speak with God, to speak about God, to speak about Christ with such confidence and clarity and power. Because you see, what happens after this occasion when we see Stephen being caught up with these elders and all the rest of it, we, we see um, Stephen continuing to preach into the next chapter and he, he digs into the scripture again. He gives an amazing testimony about the prophets and all the way back to Abraham and Moses and he witnesses strongly to Christ in the presence of the Sanhedrin where Peter and John had just been once again. And they are absolutely infuriated once again by the preaching of Jesus' name. At this stage, they're thinking, will we ever be done with hearing about this man? As long as the disciples lived and moved and breathed, no, they wouldn't. And today, as long as the disciples of Jesus live, move and breathe, no, we will not stop. And so they're so infuriated with Stephen. Even in the spite of the fact that his face was shining like an angel, this is a man who was holy and who lived with the presence of God flowing out of them. Still they killed him. Still they killed him. Because such was the desire to prevent opposition to the name of Jesus. And we're told that as they were about to take up stones and take the life of Stephen, there was a man named Saul standing at the side holding the coats of those who were throwing the stones, thinking that he was going to be part of this ultimate victory of the quashing of the name of Jesus, only to find that in a very short while, Jesus would say to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And so from the very worst, 
be turned to one of the greatest apostles of the church. And the victory of God continued. Now, I tell you all this, folks, because this is the story that we are in. We're still in this story. This is, this is, our, this is our birthright. As much as you might sit and tell me of, of the place where you grew up, of the people that lived in your street, and what it was like when you went to Sunday school, or the church you were a part of, or what your first job was like, and, and all the way through your life, your story goes much further back than this to these people who are beginning the work of taking the message of Jesus everywhere. And they are our primary example. And in today's passage, we learn again just the immense privilege it is to serve Jesus. The privilege it is to speak for Jesus. And the great privilege it is for Jesus to be about absolutely everything in our lives. I've become very convicted in these last few months as I live here and as I move around us and around some of the other churches as well. And one of the things that I am deeply, deeply, deeply convinced about is that if Jesus Christ is not at the centre of the people who call themselves the church of Jesus Christ, then you have no church. You have no church. Because not even the simplest task of waiting at table in the kingdom of God will be authentic if Jesus is not at the heart of it. Mm. Anybody can wait on a table. Anybody can wait on a table. But in the kingdom of God, there's something powerful that takes place when God's people moved, inspired by his spirit, with Jesus right at the center. He is proclaimed, he is shown, he is demonstrated. And where Jesus Christ is lifted up, not the church or the music or the minister or the building or the, or the whatever or the cup of tea afterwards or the whatever. When Jesus Christ is lifted up, mm-hmm. people will be drawn. Mm-hmm. People will be drawn. Mm-hmm. And I want, I want to see our people here on this island being drawn to Jesus Christ. Being drawn to him. Your neighbours, your friends the people you see in the cafe, the visitors that come and visit us, being drawn to Jesus Christ because the church is lifting them up. And so we're from various places here this morning, across the island and in other parts. Wherever it is you are, whether you're gathered with your church family or whether you're there as your own family in your own place or whether you're just ploughing that solo furrow, lift Jesus up. Lift Jesus up. Let his name be heard coming from our lips in some way or other. Let his name be shining from our lives. Mm -hmm. Let his name be the name that is lifted high so that all men might be drawn. To give one more quote to the Booths today, because I quite like them. Mm -hmm. It was Catherine Booth who said, uh, when everything else has been tried and found wanting, she said, try tears, try tears. Get yourself into the place where you consider the plight of those that are around you. That will transform your willingness to speak for Jesus, to live for Jesus, to lay tables for Jesus, to do whatever for Jesus. But whatever it is, let it all be for him. And we have a poignant reminder for us today as we come around the Lord's table now.